So if I were to say to you the word terroir, how many of you know what that word means? Okay, I got a few hands, not 100%. Well, terroir is a word, it's a French word, and it comes up in the wine world. And it often comes up when you're drinking wine with friends, because everybody's 21 and older. And it, it comes up when a friend will smell a wine and they'll say, oh, I really smell the terroir in the glass, or I, I taste the terroir. But for our purposes today, that's not a terribly useful way to use this word. I think what makes the most sense is to go back to the basic definition of terroir. Now, the basic definition of terroir states that terroir is the, is the complete natural environment in which a wine is produced, including factors such as soil, topography, and climate. Now, that's all fine and good, and you've got rolling hillsides and soil and sunny vineyards, but it seems to me an oversimplistic definition. Like, it seems to be lacking something. And I want to take a small aside and try and get at what that might be. And it might seem like a stretch at first, but I, I think it'll sort of make sense. So back in 1988, my family moved to this area when my father took a job working for the Garden and Museum Wintertour. And for those of you not from this area, Wintertour was formerly a private estate owned by the DuPont family. And the DuPonts were sort of like, you know, Delaware's equivalent of the Rockefellers or the Kennedys or, you know, like a Gatsby or something like that. You know, they did all right for themselves. But, you know, it's 1988 and I'm four years old and what do I care about? I mean, I've just, you know, just learned how to potty train. I've accomplished rudimentary speech developments. I don't care about gardens or DuPonts or terroir. But some, you know, 20 plus years later, I started learning about wine. And I realized that what was happening at this garden was they were cultivating a sense of place or a sense of terroir. And where this starts is in the first half of the 20th century, where Henry Francis DuPont, who was the last private owner of the estate, he cultivated that garden, he tended to it, and he directed its fate. He did it so well that it wasn't until years after his death in 1969 that the board at the time realized that nature was reclaiming Henry's garden. And it was doing so in only the wildest of ways as nature tends to do. Now the reason this was happening was because Henry had a philosophy, and his philosophy was a naturalistic garden. And the board at the time had taken that to mean, well, just let nature do its thing, and you'll have a beautiful garden. But the problem is that when nature does its thing, it, it can create great beauty, don't get me wrong, but you lose the careful hand that's used to cultivate a beautiful garden. So cut back to 1988. Well, first I'll say that uh, what Henry had actually meant by naturalistic gardening was that on the grounds of his 60-acre garden was a natural opportunity for plants to thrive. But not all plants, specific plants. Certain plants would thrive best on certain slopes, under certain solar exposures, in particular shade. You know, the entire grounds weren't good for every single plant. And to really coax beauty out of this garden, you need to have a careful and guiding hand to find the right place for each plant, for the crocuses, for the azaleas, for the hydrangea. They can't all just go in one lump. So back in 1988, my father and a very dedicated team, they spent three years and they used Henry's philosophy. And they used it to reclaim his garden from the savageness of nature. This, this idea that each of these plants had an opportunity and an ideal place to show their brightest colors and to bloom brilliantly. But what does this have to do about wine? What is the relationship to Henry's garden and wine? Well, the same thinking Henry used when he was planting his garden is the same thinking you could use if you're planting a vineyard. No small task, mind you. So not all hillside, hillsides, not all vineyard sites, not all places are created equal for all wine grapes. You know, and if you let a wine grape grow wild, it's going to do the same thing as that garden. It's going to spread life abundantly, but the wine's not going to be very good. So what is it that makes a place better for one grape than it is for another? Well, I think one example you can see is that here in the States, we're used to labeling wines out of the grapes that they're made. So you might not all be able to see it from where you're sitting, but very clearly on this label it says Chardonnay. And that's a relatively new phenomenon, and that's generally what we do here in America. In classic wine growing regions of Europe, what they tended to do was label by the place. So what I have here is what's a 2009 Premier Cru Montmartre Chablis from the producer Louis Michel. And that's a whole lot of information. But nowhere on this bottle does it say it's really from Burgundy in France, 
nor does it say it's made from the same grape as this wine, the Chardonnay. Now, why the differing philosophies? Well, Europe has a much longer wine tradition than we do, and classically, they would label by region. And why is, why is this Chablis region so special? Well, the soil in Chablis that all the best vineyards are situated on is a Kimmeridgean marl. Now, Kimmeridgean marl is an ancient soil, and it's full of fossilized oysters and chock full of these little sea beasts. And you would wonder why, because Chablis is fairly far inland in Burgundy. But the soil is a few hundred million years old, a few hundred million years when this part of France was underwater. So we're talking great geologic history. Now, because this soil has these little sea beasts and it's so old, and it's had mineral and sediments and all sorts of deposits built up over time, it has very specific mineral and nutrient content, not to mention the way the soil holds or releases water. And these are factors that you have to look at when you're picking which grape to plant in which soil. And it's just like Henry would do in his garden. So, you know, Burgundy has a head start on us in winemaking. They started planting grapes, well, a very long time ago, but for our purposes, we're going to talk about a thousand years ago. And about a thousand years ago, you've got monks who are planting grapes, and the monks are the literate ones, so they're the ones who can keep records. And what they would do is they would say, well, we'll try 10 grapes, and we'll try that soil over there. And they would keep records, and they would say, well, which grapes did well on that soil? They'd make note of the hillsides. They'd make note of the sunshine. And again, I take it back to Henry, figuring out where to put the crocuses, where to put the azalea. And they would take other visual clues. You know, these guys, they didn't have the Farmer's Almanac. They didn't have Wikipedia. If you go online right now, I guarantee you, you could find 10 years of rainfall data for Chablis. So what these guys were doing is they would look outside, they would look out from their monastery in the dead of winter, and they'd see these snow-covered hillsides. And they'd notice that that one over there tended to melt faster than anywhere else. So what does this clue mean for them? Well, they see that it gets more sunlight during the day. And they think about that, and they think, well, that means the fruit's going to get riper. And if the fruit gets riper, the grapes have more sugar. So they keep building on these, on these factors. And if you have grapes with higher sugar, that gives you the option to make grapes, grapes wine with more sweetness or wine with more alcohol. Your choice. You're the winemaker. You do whatever you want. So you've got soil, which is obviously important. You've got sun, pretty important. What else could you talk about? I mean, I could talk about ambient yeasts and wild bacteria and mycorrhizal fungus, but I don't think anybody has time for that. So we move on to one of the more visually obvious factors. Let's look at the wind. You know, what wind does for a vineyard is that it helps prevent fungal infection and mildew. And when you're making wine, that's a very important thing to keep out of the grapes. Because if you have two vineyards with, hypothetically, the exact same variables, with the only difference being one has wind, one doesn't, in a humid year, the one that has the wind, it could still produce beautiful wine. But the one without the wind, if you're not really careful to get those moldy grapes out, your wine's going to taste like compost. And I don't, I don't think anybody wants wine that tastes like compost. So you've got sun, you've got soil, you've got wind. And a lot of figuring out what of these factors you have in your vineyard depends where in the world you plant your grapes. I mean, if I plant Chardonnay in California, and then I plant Chardonnay in France, they're going to taste very different. You know, if you're looking at a globe and you look where in the world wine grapes are planted, you've got about two bands of latitude in either hemisphere, between 30 and 50 degrees. It's too cold by the poles, it's too hot by the equator. So you've got all these natural factors that you can choose from, place, wind, sun, soil. But just when you think you can plant your vineyard and you'll be in good shape, all of a sudden there are all these other factors, factors that the farmer can't control with the natural environment. Market influence, winemaking, grape growing. It's a business. It's a livelihood. You need to be able to make money and survive doing it. If you're making wine that nobody wants, you're not going to survive. The fashion now is to prefer dry wines. Sweet wines are not as in vogue as they used to be. But if you look three, four hundred years ago, some of the most valuable wines in the world were wines with more residual sugar, fortification. And why the difference? Well, if you're looking back then, did they have refrigerated shipping containers, walk-in fridges at the restaurants? 
No, it was temperature was left wild to nature. So a wine with more sugar, more alcohol, they'll travel better. They have a longer shelf life. But now that we have fridges, temperature controlled fermentation, you go into any kitchen in any restaurant, you can just walk right into the cold box. But the result is that these sweet wines, their popularity is waning. Once highly valued, now much less so. So we've gone from sun, soil, earth, wind, a little water, that doesn't hurt. And now we're on to market influence. How about local materials? You know, when you're making wine, the easiest thing to do is use what's around you, use the local materials. So if I was a winemaker in the mid 1700s in Bordeaux in France, and I'm making red wine, I've got to put it in something. I've got to sell it in something. It's got to be transported somehow. Well, what do I have nearby Bordeaux in France? I have an oak forest. Curiously enough, a French oak forest. So I'm going to use French oak to store and transport my wine. It just makes the most sense pragmatically and from a cost perspective. It wouldn't make any sense for me to go to Hungary or to go to Slovenia or go to the United States to bring in oak when I can just get it from my backyard. So the result now, hundreds of years later, is that well-produced Bordeaux, red Bordeaux, often has flavors and aromas associated with French oak. And as a result, this wine and emulators of its style often seek that out, and it's, it's highly valued. So now you've got market sources, you've got your pragmatic materials. How about local cuisine? You know, the old adage in the wine industry is when you're pairing wine and food, what goes together, what grows together goes together. And this makes sense because, you know, like let's say you're in Tuscany, under a Tuscan sun, drinking Tuscan wine, eating Tuscan food, it's gonna pair beautifully, it's gonna be delicious. I mean, why would it do anything but? I mean, nobody would want to enjoy food or wine that tastes terrible with the food they're eating. It would just be an unpleasant experience for everybody. So you've got your run-of-the-mill natural factors, and then you've got these other factors that maybe we hadn't thought of at first. Now, I thought I'd gotten a pretty good handle on all that as I was reading and learning about wine. But then I went to a tasting last year, and this brought another factor forward that I had never considered before. Now, this was a tasting featuring the wines of Chateau Moussard. Now, Chateau Moussard is a pretty remarkable winery for two reasons. Number one, they put Lebanon on the, WAP, on the map for fine wine production. Number two, while most vineyards will release their wines one or two years after the harvest, Chateau Moussard doesn't release theirs for seven years after the harvest. And their thinking is that over seven years, the flavors come together, they integrate, they meld. It's the same idea as slow cooking a stew low and slow and better flavor integration. So at this tasting, we tasted their, their rosé, their white, their red, and they were all very nice wines. They were very good wines. And we tasted many vintages. So in the red wine, we tasted their 2004, their 2000, their 1998, and their, oh, their 1990, 1998, 1984. So the 84 was pretty cool for me. I really enjoyed tasting that wine. Now, uh, for sort of selfish reasons. So I was born in 1984, and I think drinking wine from your birth year is a wonderful experience because you get to taste a wine that has existed the entire time you've been alive. You're basically tasting a food product that survived 20, 30, 40 plus years, and the flavors aren't always perfect, but it's always special. So anybody like me, born in 1984, that searched for birth year wine, has found out that 1984 was a terrible wine for wine production. Terrible year. The weather was bad, the grapes were bad, the wine was bad, except for a few pockets here and there, but it, it was just not good if you're looking for birth year wine. So we're tasting through these vintages of Musar, and the first four were, you know, they had a consistent house style. You could tell that there was a difference because they were different ages, but there was a consistency between them. Now the 84, aside from me liking it and being interested because it was my birth year, you know, you go through the usual steps when you're tasting and drinking wine. You, you look at the wine, you swirl the wine, you smell the wine, and that's where I stopped. I smelled the wine, and all of a sudden, this sense memory just kicks in, and it takes me immediately back to the church that I attended growing up. And this wine, it had, you know, the aromas were outside of the norm for not just the red wines there, but most of the red wine I smell and taste on a regular basis. And, you know, when you go into an old bookstore 
or an old church, and you have this smell that's the accumulated effect of hundreds of years of experience of hundreds of thousands of people passing through there, you realize there's something special about this. There's a story behind it. So we wondered, what, what was causing this? And the owner of the winery told us that from their vineyard to their winery was a drive of about two hours, usually, because their vineyards are high up in the mountains. Now, in 1984, they had a different experience. Their trip went from two hours to five days. Now, the reason for this was they ran into something of a roadblock. And not like a metaphorical roadblock, but like actual roadblocks because the Lebanese Civil War was going on. So they're driving this truck from town to town, roadblock to roadblock, trying just to get back to their winery. All the while, under the hot, you know, August, September sun, these grapes are just fermenting away in the back of this truck in a really primitive way, the way they would if you, were, if you just threw a bunch of grapes into a pot 4,000 years ago. But, you know, they're, they're professionals, so they said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make this wine. And they went ahead and they made it, and it tasted completely different than any other vintage we tasted. But it had the flavors, unmistakably, of the war vintage. So aside from the local and cultural influences, now we have political climate. We have the war. And no matter what the soil offered to the grapes, no matter how much rain fell, no matter how the sun shined that year, the war throws a wrench in the whole process. And it's not the sort of thing you can track with rainfall charts and tracking daily solar hours. So this, this stuck in my mind. And as a result, after that, when I'd watch the news and I'd see stories about refugees or people displaced by war, all of a sudden I started thinking about this bottle of wine. And, in re and vice versa, I started thinking more about these people. So you know, you may notice that we have an election tomorrow. And there's been a lot of news. I mean, we're bombard bombarded with news every day. So if I hadn't had this wine, would I have taken better notice of the refugees, of the people displaced by war? Maybe, but maybe not, with the amount of information that's just thrust at us every day. And the same thing, very recently, last week, maybe two weeks ago in, Europe, in Italy, they had earthquakes. And these earthquakes, they destroyed property, they destroyed landmarks, old churches, they destroyed homes. You know, and Italy's not the only place. In the last five years, California, Chile, they've all been hit by earthquakes. And, you know, for the people who are there making this wine, this is always the earthquake vintage. Because an earthquake can actually, believe it or not, affect the final flavors of wine. Not to mention the memories associated with losing family and losing friends. You know, so you've got all these factors that you don't typically think of when you think about a sense of place in winemaking or terroir. So, yeah, I mean, let's jump back to that basic definition. That terroir is the complete natural environment, including factors such as soil, topography, and climate. This clearly to me seems like an insufficient definition. And not just insufficient because it doesn't explicitly describe enough, but insufficient because it doesn't encourage us. It doesn't encourage us to think about who's behind the wine, what brought the wine here today, what trials and tribulations, what suffering, what success. How did this get here? So I think a good definition of terroir has to include, of course, the natural environment, but you, you must consider the political climate the social aspects, the cultural aspects. And I don't, I don't want to get too heavy with all this, because this is all very sort of doom and gloom. But, you know, first and foremost, I want people to enjoy wine. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a beverage that people should enjoy with friends, with family. And, you know, I mean, also selfishly, I think people should enjoy wine, because if they don't, I'm out of a job. And I, I need to pay bills. But I think good wine is worthy of our attention. And I think good wine is like good art, good philosophy, good music, in that it expands our horizons. It lets us see cultures and people that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. So you don't always have to you know, spend your time thinking about every little aspect that went into a bottle of wine. But maybe the next time you do enjoy a glass, just think about where it comes from and how we're all connected by it. Thank you.